parti de nous pour le présenter. Je crois que vous savez tous qui il est, donc il est inutile que j'en dise plus. Euh, nous sommes tous très contents et très fiers euh, de l'accueillir ici. Euh, et je crois qu'on pourrait peut-être commencer par lui faire un accueil enthousiaste. Great 
music in the toy shop for me. And it was wonderful to play with this toy. But in 1950, which is when I was 24, in 1950, records were very limited. We think today, the technology today is amazing. Uh, everything is digital, everything, everything is computers, everything is synthetic. In 1950, we were making records much the same way as they used to make records 25 or 50 years before. After all, records didn't exist until the beginning of the 20th century. And here we were, halfway through the 20th century, and they hadn't really changed very much. They were still breakable shellac discs. They had 78 RPM, 78 RPM. Mono, and each disc could only contain, at the most, four and a quarter, maybe four and a half minutes of music at all. So one of my first jobs as a classical producer was to cut up the music, was to go to the conductor of the ensemble and say, right, this is a serenade that lasts 15 minutes. I've cut it into four sections for you. I mean, isn't that all? I had to do that. It hurt me to cut music up. But it was the only way I could get it done with So I would say we will finish, finish on bar 98, but resolve the chord to go to the next side. Well, that, that was my beginning. But even more primitive than that was the machinery that we used. Because unlike the modern recording studio, the actual room, the studio itself, was beautiful. Lovely acoustics, great. But the control room was quite different from what you imagine today. To begin with, nobody sat down. Everybody stood. Very pompously, in, uh, in the engineers wore white coats, producers like me always wore a collar and top and a suit. Not the informality of today. We, we had a tape machine, but it was so awful that we never used it. Because tape in 1950 had very poor quality. The noise from the tape, the hiss, was awful. And if you use a tape to record, then the to transfer it to this, and the resultant hiss was not working. So we used to cut directly out of this. And they used to do this by means of glass discs, which were coated with wax, which were kept in cupboards, heated cupboards, in the corner of the room. And the engineer who was responsible for mixing and making the recording would take this out and place it on a lathe with a turntable, a huge machine, about six feet long, where he used to stand. And this was the recording machine. And when the time came to make the record, he would start the turntable, lower the needle, and the recording would go. But that lathe was not driven by electricity. Because in 1950, the electricity supply was not terribly stable. And if you used electricity from the grid, you were likely to have a record that would vary in speed as it, as it was playing. So you could not use electricity to drive the lake. So they used the most constant power known to man. Never varied. Can you imagine what it is? The most constant power that never varied drove that lake. It was gravity. Gravity never changes. 
And the power of light never changes. So before each take, the engineer would wind a huge weight to the ceiling. Unbelievable, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and when he started recording, the weight would gradually fall until the recording was finished. And this was the recording studio that I joined. <laughs> well, timing is most important in anyone's life. I assure you, if you pick the right time to do something, it's probably more important than what you do. And timing, good timing, has always been for me a blessing. And my timing of choosing to go into the record business in 1950 was impeccable. Because within two years, I didn't know this, but within two years, on the horizon was a new fangled invention called a long playing record. A vinyl which rotated not at 78 RPM, but at 33 and a third. And I welcomed this enormously because it meant we could record up to 20, 25 minutes a sign. Wonderful! I wouldn't have to cut music anymore. I wouldn't have to bring out my blasted scissors and chop off my lovely, lovely sounds. And you know what? The chap who ran EMI, the head of EMI, Sir Ernest Fisk, it was his name, indelibly imprinted upon my heart. He was an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and he made a declaration. He said, we have examined this new technique from America, and we have found it is not satisfactory. <laughs> We do not intend to join this rat race. I could have killed him. <laughs> well, so Ernest this didn't last long, and within a year, EMI had to eat humble pie, as we say in England, and join the rat race and become and start making vinyl records. And for me, this was a revolutionary time. And I was right in the thick of it. So I made the best of it. And I started experimenting. We found that tape was getting better. We started using tape. We still had mono. Stereo was just around the corner. But stereo was reserved purely for classical records. And we weren't allowed to use it on pop. But by this time, I got hooked. I was, I'd given up. Ideas of becoming Black Man of the Second. I liked working in the studio so much um, that I wanted to go on doing this. And gradually, my boss gave me more and more things to do. So that instead of just doing classical music, I found myself doing orchestral music, light orchestral music, jazz, Scottish country dancing. Folk music, children's records, spoken word. He threw the lot at me. And I took it. And I was working and working and working. And five years later, in 1955, I was 29. And my boss was 65. And at that age, he had to retire. He was he could no longer go on working. And I was very depressed about this because I knew perfectly well that some other bloke would come in above me and start telling me what to do. And I'd had really quite a, a good deal of freedom after that time. But at the farewell dinner from my boss, the new head of EMI, Sir Ernest Fisk, having gone, announced the name of his successor. And I was wondering who the hell it was going to be. And they said, and the person who we've appointed to take over Parlophone Records is George Martin. Well, I 
You could not be down with a feather. <laughs> I was astonished. I was happy. I was somewhat fearful. I couldn't understand why they'd given me the job. Except that obviously I must have been fairly good at it. But it was more than that. I guess I was cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the other reason was that I think they were thinking of shutting the label down. Because it wasn't very successful. And it was up to me to try and make it into something successful. But it was a good challenge. Now, when you're in your 20s and you're given a task to do that nobody's done before, it's a challenge. And I looked at the record market and said to ask myself, what do I need to do to make this label a success? I could go on and make classical records and folk music and jazz and so on, but that's not the answer. My other label were HMV and Columbia, and they were big boys. And they had contracts with America, so they had artists on their label like Elvis Presley, or Frank Sinatra, or Doris Day, all the big stars. Poor little part of them had enough. What <coughs> did they do to combat these big fellows? I had to do something fairly different. It so happened that I got to know an actor called Peter Ustinov. You've probably heard of him. Yes. He actually, not many people know this, but Peter Ustinov was a very good authority on Baroque music. He knew a lot about music and a lot about classical music. And it was through my Baroque connections that I met him. And he used to do a party piece where he would imitate an opera. Which one is Cliff Richard? Which one is Elvis Presley? <laughs> None of them. So I thought, well, maybe I should take them where they are. So we, we got a good balance on them, and I brought them into the control room. And listen, I said, look, I've really no idea what to do, but have a listen to what we've done, and tell me if there's anything you don't like. And it was then that George Harrison looked at me and said, Well, I don't like your tie for a start. <laughs> I think that was the moment when I fell in love. <laughs> because they knew about me. They knew the records I'd made. They were great fans of the Goons, and great fans of Peter Sellers, which is why George was so cheap here. And they had this wonderful sense of humour. Irreverence. I mean, I was a formal, I was a very formidable character to them, but they, they just rode with it. And I thought they were delightful. They had great charisma. You know what, you know what I mean by charisma? Great, great feeling. And I thought, well, if they have that effect upon me, they'll probably have the same effect upon an audience. They will be able to charm the audience as they've charmed me. So I gave them a contract. I thought, what am I going to lose? I gave them a lousy contract. It wasn't very good for them. But I, it was a contract which gave me a, a year solid. Solid. And four more years of old. Well, you know this. But it wasn't their music. Which sold me. It was them as people. Their music then was no better than P.S. I Love You, One After 909, Love Me Too, the best they could do. Not very good. They had played to me on that first demo a song which was a kind of dirty, royal person type ballad. And I said, This is very depressing. If you speed it up by twice, make it fast, we might have made something on it. So I gave them something else to record. They came back and they said, we've done what you said. Please, will you listen to it? 
and it was quite different when it was fast with a harmonica in the beginning. I said, well, let's record it. We worked on it. And at the end of the tape, I pressed the switch and I said to them, gentlemen, I believe you've got your first number one. The song was Please Please Me. And it was number one. But the great thing about the Beatles was that they learned very, very quickly. For me, it was like planting a seed in a greenhouse and watching it grow. And they grew quickly. They flourished, they bloomed. And their secret to me was that they never, ever gave me the same thing twice. They never gave me Star Wars 2 or <laughs> Harry Potter 3. <laughs> it was always something fresh, something new, and I loved them for it. And I told them this, I said, while you go on surprising me, you'll be successful. So always surprise me. And they never failed to do that. Sometimes the surprises weren't so good, but they were surprising. <laughs> well, we know how successful they were. They came to Paris in the early days, in 1963. Four. And curious enough, I came over with them because the German people had insisted that they wouldn't release a Beatles record unless it was sung in German, which was nonsense. And the Beatles said it was nonsense. But my bosses said it wasn't nonsense, so I was told to go and record the Je Beatles in German. And the place to do that, obviously, was Paris. <laughs> <laughs> the Beatles could speak a smashing of German in their days in Hamburg. And so they were appearing in the Paris Olympia, which was a kind of musical in those days. Does it still exist? Yeah, it does. They had a very rocky beginning. I'm afraid the Parisian, Parisian people didn't like them very much. With their long hair and their raucous music, they were treated not too good. But they, they, because they were already big success in England, and they were, we were trying to get them successful in America, they were staying at the Georges Saint. My wife and I couldn't afford to stay at the Georges Saint. We stayed at the Royal. But I recorded them down in the Café Marconi studios outside Paris. And after the recording, we all went back. And we, I was in bed at one o'clock when Brian Epstein telephoned me. He said, I'm very sorry to wake you, George. But I think, I hope you think it's worthwhile. I thought you should be the first to know. I just heard in New York that I want to hold your hand as content number one in the American charts. Wow! <laughs> that was good news. Of course, we couldn't sleep anymore. We went around to the George Sand, and there was everybody having a great time. We had a wonderful time. So, Paris was a high on their agenda for a memorable occasion. 